so we're going to go ahead and, and, and get started. Uh, the way this is going to work is we're going to have each, each of these wonderful people come up one by one and give their pitch. Obviously, there's, there's no slides here. This is just one mic, all passion. Let's go. And you got five minutes to make your pitch, and then you'll have about two minutes for Q&A. The judges, our lovely judging panel, who I'll be introducing in a moment, uh, will we'll be uh, having an opportunity to ask some questions. Folks in the audience will have an answer, uh, an opportunity to ask some questions, and then we'll just keep it moving. Get through the get through the list. At the end, we're gonna tally up the judges' scores and pick the top two for first place and runner-up, best Daiko pitch of the evening. And then after that, we've got DJ Anya spinning DJ set back here, and we're gonna party the rest of the night. There's uh, there's no end to how late you can stay if you want to sleep in the hotel lobby. Uh, I didn't say you could do that, but I'm not going to say you can't. But the drinks get cut off at about 9.30. So drink up till 9.30. After that, it's a cash bar. Food, it's there until it's gone. Um, we have a bunch of merch over here in the corner. If you want to grab some Aragon swag, there's... Hoodies, T-shirts, there's stickers all around the food area. Uh, please don't take Pickle Rick. Um, I love him dearly. And uh, that's pretty much it as far as housekeeping goes. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can come find me during the pitch contest. I'll be right around here. Uh, but for the most part, it should be pretty straightforward. We're going to go ahead and kick this off. But first, I want to introduce our wonderful panel of judges who is actually going to be determining the fate of these Daiko pitches this evening. First up, we have Louis Jro from the Aragon Association. Next, yeah, round of applause for Louis. Thank you, Louis. Next, we have Chem Dagdalen from the Aragon Black team and the Pando Project. Oh, yeah. Chem, round of applause. Next, we have Quasia from Autark, who's working on a really amazing open enterprise dApp. And finally, Maria Gomez from Aragon One. Thank you all so much. Um, and now we're gonna we're gonna jump right into it. So could Cooper Turley from the Zeno Dico come up? Hey, what's going on, guys? My name's Cooper Turley, and I'm pitching on behalf of a die code called Xeno. Yeah? Can everyone hear me all right back there? Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, um, I've been working in music for about the past five years. I've also been working in blockchain, and I feel like there's a really interesting intersection to be had between the two. For me, I've been looking at what can we do to find purpose in life? For me personally, music is a great way for me to find purpose. It unlocks a lot of creativity. And it's a really beautiful avenue for just discovery and something that really means a lot to you. In particular, I think that the DAO model is interesting for incentivizing... Whoa. Sorry. Incentivizing curation or taste making. In particular, if you ever find an artist that's super early on, there's nothing better than watching them go to the main stage of a major festival or going on to do some really amazing things. I think that the DAO model could be interesting for figuring out how to profit off of curation and taste making from a very early level. Um, you know, right now it's obviously difficult to coordinate taste making on a global scale. It might be interesting in very niche markets, but in particular I think it's difficult to figure out where different artists are doing well across the world. For Zeno as a DAO, I think it would be interesting to curate one event that's globally funded by people from all over the world, come to a consensus on which artists we feel like would be best representative of the DAO and their ideas, and then use the funds from that model to put on an event, in which case all DAO members get to share in the profits of that event. This is obviously a very new idea for me. It's something that I haven't pursued professionally by any means or way, shape, or form. Now, this is pretty much just all off the cuff, but just to kind of summarize again, I think there's a lot of potential in curation as a passive income. 
If you recognize an artist from upfront, we could use smart contracts or some sort of blockchain technology to allow for you to be able to profit from their future revenue, their future income, anything of that sort. Uh, in conclusion, I think it's interesting to note that we want to build a system that's not um, dependent on the artist to be able to have it succeed. We ultimately want to use something like a continuous token model or a bonding curve to be able to issue unique markets for artists just based off of what the DAO feels is interesting and what they feel like could be a nice potential market in the future. Again, my name is Cooper Turley and this is the Zeno DAO. Thank you guys. We have plenty of time, so let's uh, use the balance of your time for questions. Sure. Any questions for Cooper? Yeah. yeah, so it wasn't entirely clear. Um, yeah. It wasn't entirely clear whether you're trying to replace the current ways festivals are put on or more replace like a traditional record label interaction. So could you go into, like I think at one point you said um, basically you're trying to get tastemakers to decide whether or not artists will have a positive trajectory, but it seems like those are t kind of two different ideas. Can you like go a little bit more into which one this is or how they intersect? Right. So in particular, I think the continuous token model for the upside of future revenues would be interesting. As far as the DAO itself, funding uh, smaller events, probably a um, 500 cap venue or less, would be a good starting point. And how would you ensure that the revenues of the event ties back to the curve and as a sort of dividend to the project uh, token holders? So first and foremost, the event would be funded by the DAO or by the funding of the DAO. With the funding from that event, assuming that it's successful, that would be used to buy back tokens off of the continuous token model. Assuming that that's off chain, how would you ensure that it goes to the curve in a trustless way? Yeah. Um, you know, as I said, this is definitely pretty early on, but as I imagine it, you know, the continuous token model would be issued from start. The artist would be, you know, based off a very base price, and then as more people enter, the token price would go up along with the supply. And by using profits from an event that we hosted, theoretically, there would be more buy pressure because those profits would be used to buy tokens off of that continuous token model. Uh, I'm not sure if that answered your question, though, so if I can state it another way. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a big question. It's not only about right. this project, but how do you ensure that in real life the revenue that you generate actually goes back to Oh, okay. Yeah, I would say that we would probably just convert the USD from the event profit into a stable coin like DAI and then issue that in dividends to the token holders that are holding any of those continuous tokens. Thank you, guys. Um, where's light? Where's light? Next up, we have Dennison Bertium with Word Dico. Welcome, Dennison. Hey. Let me take this off. Yep. Hello, everyone. My name is Dennison Bertram, and I am talking about the Word DAO, or in this case, Word DICO. It's a new model for funding public infrastructure on Ethereum, incentivizing collective participation to do this. So as you know, if you're Solidity developers, storing strings on the Ethereum blockchain is a very expensive process. It costs a lot of gas, it's inefficient, it leads to bloat of the blockchain. So the idea behind WordDAO is we're gonna put all the words on the blockchain once, and then just reference them by integer going forward, right? So this way, when we wanna write something, we just use an array of integers, which is an extreme cost savings in terms of space, and we don't have to use strings anymore. So, how we're gonna do this is we're going to have a system and this is actually already built, but what you're gonna do is you're gonna pay $1 and the gas required to store a word on the blockchain, right? In exchange, oh, the point of this dollar is to prevent people from just registering everything simply because they're willing to pay the gas. So it's sort of like a spam prevention mechanism. But the idea is, is that when you pay this fee to put the word on the, in the DAO, you get an ERC-20 token which represents your voting power. So in the case of the English language, there's about 450,000 words which you can register. At the end of this process, that means we'll have about $450,000 in the DAO. So using this ERC-20 token, 
you can now vote on how to spend this money. The goal of spending this money is to pay developers to create plugins which actually make the words which are stored in the DAO more useful. Examples of this might be creating legal contracts as arrays of integers rather than using off-chain hashes for IPFS. The problem that this is solving is the data availability problem where smart contracts are never really sure if the document that they reference via the IPFS hash actually still exists, right? This gives you the ability to create a legal document which smart contracts can be natively aware of the contents which you can then use online, or on the blockchain, right? So when you build these plugins, the idea is, is that when you use the word DAO, you pay a small fee. Maybe it's simply a couple way. So every time someone interacts with these plugins, this money, this small way, goes back into the DAO coffers, which then the individuals who are members of the DAO can use to vote and continue to support more development. The idea is to create like a community infrastructure of its own kind of economy around this idea. So the idea is very simple, but it's actually illustrating a greater concept of how we can use DICOs to incentivize the public to build its own public infrastructure. There's no real limit or there's no barrier to access. Everyone can participate, but this could be abstracted to part used for other concepts, right? For specific mathematical types of applications that require uh, tables of specific values. You could imagine something that kept, keeps a large number of prime numbers on chain. And what it does is it actually reduces blockchain bloat by making the Ethereum blockchain more useful at the same time. So that, that is essentially the concept of WordDAO. I have a minute and 19 seconds left, so that's pretty good. Questions? Um, were you saying that users who want to access a word have to pay to access it? No, so accessing word would be free, but if you build plugins that are then useful themselves, like for example a legal document, you could have a legal repository, and users who want to use the legal repository, right, they would pay a small fee which can be shared between the plugin, which does the legal repository, and then the DAO itself. But reading from it would be free, and then of course you could also build um, off-chain tools. So the idea is the words are actually stored in a Mer Merkle tree, so we already know ahead of time what the integer for all the words will be in the future when it's finished. So this is something that we can start using today, and you can fund developers to create like front-end translators which can translate documents already into these integer strings. So it's kind of a compression mechanism. All right. Question? Awesome. Oh wait, there's a question. Um, where does curve bonding fit in all of this? Uh, there isn't really necessarily a curve bonding in this model. It's not necessary. Uh, the idea is really that everyone who participates can create their own word. Uh, there was an idea maybe for using curve bonding for vanity words, right? So the ability to add your name to the word DAO for vanity reasons or to add new words in the future, in the future or in the worst case, allow people to add gibberish if they so felt they wanted to contribute funds to the project. So it would be like your gibberish. Cool. Thank you, cool. Thank you Dennison. Uh, cool. Uh, so, th yeah, thanks a lot, Dennison. Um, if we could kind of keep the volume down on on, on uh, conversations, uh, we want we want to give the the speakers uh, uh, some space to to give their pitch. So, uh, next up, we have Alex Perry with HedgeDAO. Give it up for Alex. Yeah. Test, test.
Hello, uh, my name is Alex. I'm a uh, law student from North Carolina. I'm a law student from North Carolina, and I'm also a DevCon scholar. So we've got fellow scholars over here. Um, thanks. So my, uh, stop, stop, stop trying to talk to me. I'm on the stage. All right, so my idea is called Hedge Down. So I've got some notes here. I didn't have time to rehearse this. Um, so the biggest thing that crypto, thank you. So crypto is supposed to disrupt the traditional financial system, right? But currently, the, the biggest use case that we have is trading. A lot of people trade crypto, and a lot of people have bought a lot of tops, and a lot of people have sold a lot of bottoms. Um, I know I've probably done, done it a few times as well. Um, so there's currently, it's, it's tough to, uh, for people with less capital to be able to access. Um, you, know, you can't access a lot of investment banking options um, or hedge fund options. You know, they want a lot of capital because of all the regulation. So as a law student, I'm focused on what regulation and stuff would be applicable to uh, a DAO that is a hedge fund. Um, so this is what the idea is, hedge DAO. It's, uh, um, trading the traders is essentially what this allows. People like to trade, and, and this would allow to trade the traders. <clears throat> so there's two things we have to worry about currently. If you don't have enough funds, you have to worry about the uh, investment banking laws or investment uh, manager laws. You have to worry about SEC laws. Um, so currently, all of the, the DAOs are, are assumed to be a general partnership, um, which we would actually use to our advantage here because of the SEC test. Um, so, okay, so the head, there's a two-tier system. I'm trying to get, get on the point. There's a two-tier system here. Um, there's HedgeDAO, which is a governmental body, and then they would be creating uh, DICOs underneath. The HedgeDAO is a DICO. Um, it's a bonding curve on that DICO. They'd create a uh, non-bonding curve DICOs underneath that would be run by separate traders. So... Since it's a non-bonding curve, it'd be a one-to-one -one capital ratio. So when you invest a dollar or a die, invest a die in, you get one voting share. So people would vote in the way it's, stru it's structured in a certain way to make it to where it's compliant with, with or what I would see was compliant. I'm not a lawyer, but I'm a law student. Um, so essentially, you would have a one-to-one -one ratio of when you put in a dollar, that would be one dollar of capital. So we'd give a trader, the DAO, the DICO would give a trader the uh, API keys on a temporary basis, so maybe a one-week basis. You can make expiring API keys and We'd use a, uh, a non-KYC exchange, obviously, because these are the best exchanges anyways. Um, and essentially, whenever the uh, profits were realized, um, people would vote, and it would be a proportional percentage of the funds. So it's basically, essentially, they're voting to put their funds in and have their funds given to the trader that week. Trader's on a hot streak. Great, let's give them the funds this week. So essentially, what would be happening is it's a providing a, a platform for people to, um, you know, there's obviously a clear market for this. If you go on Twitter, there's tons of paid groups. Um, we'd have a clear place to market it because currently they're absorbing a lot of liability. Um, this would help manage some of that. So we've got a one-to-one -one ratio. We give it into the funds, and after that, they deposit the funds back. All profits would be realized as additional voting shares and those individual DICOs that are the sub-DICOs, essentially the hedge DAO. Um, and we would take a percentage off the top. So the hedge DAO is a, would be a governmental body, and they would end up, as soon as any profits were realized, they would gain uh, participatory shares in the DICOs. Um, and so essentially we'd be, that, that would be the, the dividends that would be paid in the DICO. So um, as more funds and as more uh, underlying sub, the sub hedges were, were created, more profits would come in and that would make the uh, bonding curve more appetizing. So later on down the road, there's more incentive to, um, to buy into that, that governmental body that, that is the, the head. And so, you know, we'd, we'd have some type of voting mechanism to where if we need to change the rules that govern these DICOs, we could change that down the road. So if, if we find out there's some clear regulation that we need to adapt to, we could vote to do that. Um, so that's the basic idea. And uh, yeah, question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I, I didn't get uh, why nine. Um, no, why nine? Did you say like nine um, uh, uh, DAO is bonding curve tied to the like main hedge DAO? Yeah, so bonding curve to the hedge DAO initially. So we wouldn't do hedge curve, we wouldn't do a bonding curves on the sub DAOs because we want a one-to-one -one capital ratio. We wouldn't want people to profit off of shilling the, the DICOs to their friends. We wanted to say, well, you can get out anytime you want and you're going to get the amount of dollars that you have. So or die. You know, you could do you could do any crypto. It could be ether. It could be anything. Um, but die is obviously one of the clear options. 
got it. And uh, sorry, second question is like, um, so how do you think? Um, so you say that the hedge that would be taking a fee, right? Um, right. So a small percentage of the profits would be lost. Got it. I mean, yeah, I would probably fork it. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, well, why why the fee model? Well, if you forked it, you'd have. I mean, obviously, first to market's the biggest thing here. We can fork anything that comes out. I can fork the next biggest thing. I can fork MakerDAO. You know, I can fork anything. Um, but people still succeed in this space despite forking, and that's because the first to market is so important. Um, and we currently don't really have an option that gives people financial access to these types of, of things. You know, a lot of people trading is a very psychological thing, and a lot of people lose money fast. And so people still want to trade because they want to feel like they got the right choice. Just give them an option to trade in a way that we can regulate it with the, the hedge DAO. We can regulate and try to make it as safe as we can so we can limit leverage. Um, a lot of exchanges have the ability to limit leverage, and we would only give out API keys. And so it would be a rolling option. So you'd say, I'm going to commit my funds for a week, and then a week later, um, the, we'd, we'd, as the hedge DAO, we'd be extracting the funds back and redistributing them, and they can decide if they want to recommit after that week period. Got it. Thanks. You well, so I'm guessing you looked into social trading a little bit. I have. So like eToro does this, like copy trading. But the problem is you can't do it in the U.S. and you can't do it in a lot of countries. Okay. I mean, let's assume that we're in a permissionless uh, environment. Um, what I didn't get about your proposal is that um, you're giving traders some sort of a timeshare, right? Like they trade for a week and then uh, the returns. If the returns are realized, then people who have invested in there or the, the, the constituents of the DAO can choose to invest in that trader for that performance, right? Yeah. Why don't you, this is a suggest another question actually, uh, why don't you just weigh different traders um, and then average out their returns according to their performances? Right? right, so people would be able to choose which DICOs, so there's multiple ones, they'd be able to choose which one um, they they want to join, if that makes sense. Um, so it's kind of creating a marketplace of traders, and, and you know that's kind of what hedge funds do. If you're a good trader, you they want you to come in, and, and you know additionally you look at um, smaller ICOs and, and maybe other DICOs that are going to be coming. It's really tough to do fundamental analysis. It's very tough to do fundamental analysis. You have to have a very good understanding of the space. A lot of people buy on hype, and so this would help people um, find someone that is that expert that can help them invest in something that's actually worthwhile. Great. Thanks a lot. Give it up for Alex. All right, so um, first, uh, as a matter of housekeeping, um, the sitting down on the floor is, is uh, going to have to turn into standing up on the floor uh, because sitting down on the floor is a fire hazard, and we care about your safety. So if the folks standing could please, or sit, sitting could please stand, Be safe. that's greatly appreciated. Stay safe. Um, and for the folks who are kind of like closer to the bar in the back, if, if you could just come closer, get cozy. There's plenty of space like to my right if you want to fill in to my right. But we just want to keep this aisle way between the elevators in the front desk clear. That's greatly appreciated. Thank you for your quick action on all of this. You guys have been awesome. Arigato gozaimasu. Uh, next up. We have Amar Singh with Sunshine. Amar, are you in the building? You're right here. Hello, my name is Amar. I work for Parity, and I'm going to present Sunshine, a framework for coordinating upgrades for DAOs. So it's actually inspired by a paper in 2016 by Ralph Merkel called DAO Democracy. And a quote from the paper said that over time, all the components of the DAO will be upgraded using its own mechanisms. Self-improvement will be critical to the survival of any DAO-based democratic system. The proxy, so we look at existing smart contract patterns on Ethereum. The proxy pattern employed by many existing DAOs that live on Ethereum is extremely restrictive. It fosters ambiguous upgrade paths, often controlled by a small subset of stakeholders. In these situations, migrating state from one version to the next is opaque and lacks the transparency that this technology was promised to deliver. The advent of Aragon Agent and recent talks by the Aragon team demonstrate significant demand for infrastructure to coordinate smart contract upgrades. Sunshine takes this a few steps further by researching two things. One, defining how stakeholders agree on upgrades and making this process transparent. And two, defining how stakeholders can adjust 
how they agree on upgrades. This is often referred to as meta-governance, nuanced governance of the governance process itself. More experimentation needs to be done on how we define the rules to make decisions and enforce accountability among the involved stakeholders. If changes happen too slow, then the DAO suffers from stagnancy, neglect, and fragmentation. If changes happen too quickly, we see volatility, fragmentation, and collapse. We act as if coordination of upgrades is a solved problem, but so far, but thus far, we are far from a sustainable DAO design. Now, raise your hand if you've heard of Moloch. Who here has heard of Moloch? Yeah, Moloch is great. It's designed to address funding problems in the context of Ethereum's current free rider problem, but its governance of upgrades is relatively opaque. It's static and conservative. There is no configuration for default opt-in or opt-out of contract upgrades. Sunshine is designed to allow dissenters to unionize, form a coalition, and split when stakeholder interests diverge. This facilitates and or this liberates stakeholders from the course of tyranny of the majority and encourages dynamic evolution. Now, this is the part where I'm kind of scared to mention this, but I'll be honest. Sometimes I have my doubts when it comes to whether today's Ethereum can foster flexible DAO governance. It's difficult to approximate mainnet gas costs so everyone either overpays or accepts some probability that their transaction won't be included. And this isn't acceptable in the context of delegating significant decisions to on-chain organizations. Just like Aragon, Sunshine is platform agnostic, but we need to choose a blockchain that is designed to foster runtime upgrades. Substrate is a framework designed from the start to coordinate governance of runtime upgrades. Spoiler, I work for Parity and I work on Substrate. Um, and at Parity, we're using Substrate to build Polkadot and I'm using it to build Sunshine. Talk to me if you're interested. Thank you. I'm just wondering how, um, how much of a problem might it be for someone to vote to change the way um, governance is too quickly? Is that, is that potentially still a problem with this with sometimes? The idea is that upon configuration, you make some parameters variable, but then you also define the range with which they can change. Um, and it's centralized at first, just like Moloch. But uh, another thing that we add is the ability to actually change, to vote on these rates of change. So that's, that's what, where the meta-governance comes in. Um, I think I answered the question. Awesome. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, so next up, we have David with Superconscious Research Network. Did that right? Yeah, that was correct. That was correct. Yeah. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, so... I want to talk to you today about something a little bit different, so it's not that deep into uh, crypti uh, crypto infrastructure. It's about something that you may not have thought about yet. I shouldn't actually be here alone. My co-initiator, Pedram, should be here as well, but he cannot be here for one simple reason. He has difficulties just moving around the world because he's Iranian, and there is really no reason he should have this difficulty except some irrational behavior of some powerful actors in the world. And I guess a lot of you have also joined the blockchain space to fight asymmetries in power or incongruencies in the abilities that certain people have to exert their freedom on this planet. There's a problem actually that uh, transcends uh, a lot of space, uh, a lot of spaces that you people work in. So you work, I guess, in DeFi, a lot of you, some maybe try to help people avoid political or ideological censorship. Some, I know, work even in intellectual property to tear down the barriers that keep people from kind of getting their dues for the work they have done in the field of intellectual property or even research. The problem that Pedram and I, what we're working on, transcends all these fields and we call it impactful research. What is it? It's not impact investments, it's also not just simple philanthropy, it's something else. It's research that has a local impact, but in the context of the global challenges we all face on the one shared resource that we cannot avoid, which is planet Earth. And 
our goal is to make impactful research economically viable, which is not necessarily the case because philanthropy, which does impact research, is not really economically viable because it's just a black hole for money, which is good for the people between the black hole and the money, but it doesn't really always lead to that impact that we want. And we want to make it both um, um, uh, viable for the locals that see opportunities for impact, for researchers who have the know-how but may lack, may lack the uh, ability to see where they can use their know-how to have impact and people who want to fund exactly this kind, of, uh, this kind of research. Essentially, we want to help all the people through these means. How do we propose to do this? Um, we have come up with a structure that originally was not intended to be a DAO or DAICO at all. It was supposed to be a nonprofit, but we have found it to be a problem to actually get all the three, uh, three parties uh, involved in a sustainable manner, which are funders, experts, and the local members. We have come up with fancy names for them, uh, which is the will, the brains, and the third eyes. Um, and the way we envision this to work is by using a self-similar DAO structure. So we would have a big overarching DAO that would embody these three, uh, these three uh, elements, and then sub-DAOs would embody these three elements as well, but only if there's a local community that is sufficiently strong enough to provide these three functions. And they would all be connected in a self-similar structure that would provide several things. Transparency for fund transfer, um, the ability to signal issues or potential for impactful research, which we call up signaling, and of course uh, the overarching goal of the overarching DAO is to help all these elements of this structure reach the attention, the attention of all people around the world, because that is the biggest problem. I mean, you probably know about the World Economic Forum. You've seen them on Facebook. They have no problem reaching you, but the issues they talk about are important, but they, don't, they aren't part of the system that solves those problems. We want to inject that element that solves those problems into this kind of attention mechanism. And I want to talk about where we are right now. So we're not nowhere. We already have started with local projects. One is called Relive. The other is called Neuromate. Relive essentially wants to help with offsetting CO2 emissions. We have onboarded landowners in Turkey who are willing to provide their land to, pl to have trees planted that are funded by individuals and bigger donors from uh, other nations. Neuromate is essentially a more of a moonshot project. What we are trying to make sure is to help give people the tools and the knowledge that they need to make themselves more resilient against mechanisms that would exploit their attention because there are people and parties on this planet who know very well how our attention and how our brain works and we want to give these people technological defenses and we are doing research to just create the devices that we need to just help us kind of be more attentive and focus more on what is good for us and the people around us instead of what is just being fed into us. Uh, our next steps, first, grow the community more. We're focused in, uh, in the United States, uh, in Germany, and in Iran and India. Second step would be validating the crypto economics. Uh, that will we, we will do at the Diffusion Hackathon in Berlin in uh, a week and a half. And the third step, March next year, validate the entirety of our concept at the World Economic Forum. And we hope to launch sometime in April or early summer next year. I uh, thank you for your attention, guys, and fire away with questions. Two minutes. Anybody? Oh, oh there's a question coming up. So in your system, uh, undoubtedly there are good actors, there are bad actors. Are there screens for bad actors? Yes, so this is exact. So, like I mentioned at the beginning, we started doing this like a normal nonprofit, and we were a little bit greenhornish about it. True. What we want to have is have uh, the same checks and balances principle that we often see in most functional democracies, and we haven't defined the role for that yet. But we want to make very sure that there is a clear separation of power in every element that is critical to this operation. So, there's a separation of power for both funding separation uh, of power of both uh, creating output in terms of uh, media creation, stuff like that, and also, um, what, do you call it? what was the word I used? Checks and balances, sorry, yeah. And uh, checks and balances on who is actually onboarded. So we want to rely on the kind of state-of-the-art research and evidence-based um, 
experiences in the community regarding reputation systems because we're not experts in reputation systems. I mean, uh, I'm a machine learning engineer and Pedram is a, a neuroscientist, so obviously we need to learn from the community and that's why we go to these hackathons and events to just learn about that. We will not just implement something, we will implement what is state of the art. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, David. Next up, we have Jonas with Form. Um, okay, hi. So I'm Jonas. I'm a fire, ha fire hazard designer and a uh, someone who also knows how to write a smart contract. So I have a kind of a strange mix and uh, a couple of things. So one. Our current state of UX is not quite amazing, like there is still a way to go, and part of that is simply the inherent complexity that comes from decentralization. Um, so I have a strange idea, I'm not sure if it's a good idea. It's good if you can tell me if it's a bad idea, because I will not waste time on it. Um, but let's get into it. So, like, we value decentralization of all kinds. So, we have many servers, we have, like, nodes, we have many wallets, we have um, and we have many different implementations of similar ideas. So, like, it would not be good if we had just one maker or just one compound or just one Aragon. Um, we want decentralization in every possible shape, which means lots of different things for people, users to know, and it means that we really can't have a lot of tight integration throughout. Like, to the wallet, to the smart contract, to the app the user uses, throughout. So, I really like how my Ether wallet did the ENS integration. It's a first-party interface to a smart contract, but because it's like living in the wallet, it's so nice, so smooth. So how can we scale it? Like, how can we have literally every wallet have a first-party interface to every smart contract? The solution I'm thinking well, for one, we have web, and like right now, if you have any mobile wallet, you probably have a browser tab, and that browser tab is trying to do the, uh, well, the uh, wallet integration. And the web is gonna be forever. Like, the web is decentralized, it's brilliant, it's fantastic. But if we want, like, more smooth, like, native controls and, like, nice integrations, um, is there something we, else we can do on top of the web? So my idea, and uh, you can steal it or support it, is to implement kind of a user interface protocol that is sort of an annotation on top of a smart contract ABI in a sense um, that expresses in a declarative way how the user interface should look. So you don't have to have a website, you can just deploy a smart contract, add the user interface annotations, and the wallet then can expose the smart contract with nicely available beautiful native interfaces. More specifically, I think it would make sense to establish this, well, sort of it as a, a common process, perhaps in EIP, um, and work with wallets to have this native user interface integrations develop. I have a working prototype for this idea, and I think most importantly in it is that these, this form is de de expressed declaratively, like as a data structure, on top of the function that is executed. Um, and the focus of this declarative data structure is validation and, well, data, well, data integrity, essentially. And also making sure the user understands what needs to be entered for the function to work. Um, and then on side of the wallets, when they, they get this data structure, they can render it in nice, beautiful, like, um, Android controls or branded controls, whatever controls it ma that makes sense. So that's, well... That might be a cool idea. Where is, is the DAO in this? Uh, I don't know. Like, um, like maybe there is a way to make money of this. Maybe there is a way to do the governance control. Uh, probably having a first party wallet that follows the standard and makes sure that all the smart contracts that are, are available and beautiful and native and uh, so on. Perhaps there is a business model in that. Um, that was not the focus of my idea. I really am focused on the user experience and pushing the uh, adoption further. Um, have you heard of TokenScript? I have not, and that will be the first thing I'm Googling. Yeah, so um, I don't want this to be a uh, pitch, but um, basically when I explain TokenScript, you've probably explained it better than I have these past few days. So, yeah, TokenScript is intending to do exactly that. Um, I'm the product manager, I've been there for about a month, so let's talk. 
Awesome. Yeah, any other things? No? Okay. No? No. Oh, yeah? No, no, I know. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay, sorry. I mean, um, any idea about like um, how you could implement a governance model, for example, in the um, I don't know annotations that you're referring to, um, some curation on the annotations that you could put on smart contracts or something like that. Um, so I think it would make sense to keep this as a living protocol in a sense where like this is n like we cannot uh, anticipate every possible data format that might need to be entered. For instance. Um, like we might not start with a friend list, but eventually we might need to do that, or whatever, I don't know. So it does make sense to have some sort of governance, but I see it primarily as a protocol development idea, and then secondarily as a company. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jonas. So next up we have uh, Paul Lansky with InfraDAO. Paul, welcome. Thank you. We are not using the centralized systems. We are not. Ethereum is not decentralized. Did you know that every single bootstrap node that you use is actually hosted in a VPS? Yeah, all of them. All of them are hosted in VPSs. They're hosted in Amazon Web Services and they're hosted in Microsoft Azure. All of the bootstrap nodes. It's sad, but it, that's what it is. And we cannot have the centralized systems without the centralized infrastructure. And I'm going to propose here infra DAO for infrastructure DAO. Get it? Um, why is it important to have the centralized infrastructure? Uh, let's get back to 2010, 2009, where um, the Arab Spring. Um, comes up, and there's plenty of people coordinating on social media, on Twitter, on Facebook, and that's great. It, great things happen. Um, but all this coordination can be cut when the government calls the ISP and says, no more access to Twitter, and it's gone. This is not resilient. This is not decentralized. This is not scalable. Um, let's get back to Hong Kong. Let's get back to Hong Kong right now. They're using Telegram groups to coordinate, and that's absolutely fucking fantastic, and nobody knows who the owner of the Telegram account is, except they drop by the door of the dude that was the admin of the main organization group. The police knocks at the door. How did they know that? Well, Telegram might be very cool, and it's very much encrypted, but it's still a centralized party. People can still go and say, hey, who's that guy? What phone number is behind there? Where does this guy live? That's why we need the centralized infrastructure. Imagine a system where we don't have VPSs, we don't have uh, big cloud providers that are hosting all the services for us. We don't have companies and we can actually build something on Ethereum that is not gatekept by the big cloud providers and the governments that own these big cloud providers. Because let's be realistic, these big cloud providers, if Trump says tomorrow that let's, we are banning cryptocurrencies, Amazon and uh, Azure or Microsoft happen to be American companies. We don't have bootstrap nodes. We have many other nodes, but we don't have bootstrap nodes all of a sudden. Not too bad. So um, how are we going to solve that? We need, we need a DAO. Why do we need a DAO? Why do we need a decentralized autonomous organization that chooses that. Because we need money. We need money to deploy infrastructure. Infrastructure is fucking expensive. Data centers, VPSs, all of this is bloody expensive and it's extremely efficient. But why is it efficient? And you can use it for free. Why can you use Google for free if they have 13 billion in capital assets categorized on infrastructure, network infrastructure, 13 billion? and you use it for free, they're selling all your fucking data, mate. Like, everybody knows it, right? Everybody fucking knows it, and it still happens. So, we need money. We need money to deploy infrastructure. We can get people to deploy infrastructure in their own homes, and we can pay them to run this infrastructure. So, 
What I suggest is we get a bunch of money together and we give tokens from this token bonding curve to the people that are actually willing to run this infrastructure. Um, the more so any purchase of this hardware that people can run on their own homes um, gets a part of tokens. And the most important thing, governance. What do we want to do with the money that we're pulling in there? So, okay, getting hardware is cool, but is hardware enough? Is hardware, can, can hardware that we have in our homes be able to match what they have in the big data centers? Well, obviously not, because there's a lot of services on it. And that's why we need several projects. We need a lot of smarts going in there. And there's not one single infrastructure project that can help us the centralized infrastructure. So there's going to be a lot. And how are we going to choose? Well, the people that are going to be using it are going to be the ones that are going to choose what there is. And uh, it's actually a way bigger dream DAO, uh, but I'm going to have to leave it right here. Thanks. Thanks. Do you happen to have like an idea of a project that is working on such infrastructure? Like, I'm just wondering, could you, uh, do you have some projects in mind? Um, no, no, I don't. to my knowledge, there's no projects working on that. Um, well, I might have heard of this project called Dabnode, um, in, which, in which I happen to work. And, uh, and we're trying to do exactly that, the infrastructure part. Uh, thanks, legend. Um, so look it up, please. And uh, even if there is not a DAO on it, um, you can check it out. Awesome presentation. My only problem with, I mean, I have no problem actually, but my only question is, um, ICOs actually came up uh, with the same thesis, right? Give us some money and we will solve sort of like decentralization issues on this layer, that layer. But uh, what ended up happening is uh, a clusterfuck. Um, so I think the DAO has to be emphasized here, right? The accountability of the project. What are, you, what are the funds going to be allocated for? How will that accountability be transparent and so on? So what are your thoughts on that? And how are you doing this in that note, for example? So you're, you're absolutely right. Um, and uh, I got too excited on the passion side of it, and so I didn't explain the technical economics out of it. But um, so, for example, just to use some Aragon pieces, the Aragon fundraising app has a tap, and a tap that uh, leaks money at a monthly rate, so like to up to the monthly burn rate of a project. So this, um, this tap, there, there can be several taps for different projects, and the money can go, um, you're only allowed to spend, if in the curve there's like a million die, you're only allowed to spend up to your burn rate that's decided for the, um, the, the governance, so the token holders. So um, if there's another project that would like to join, working in some other part of infrastructure, we can do a, like an like a Aragon governance proposal and see, hey, do we want another group working on that? And if yes, that another tab is created. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, so the next uh, pitch is going to be Suji Yan with Data Dow. Hey, Fox. So before I arrived here, I was tweeting with John that um, kind of asking what is DAO and what is really DAO, because there's nothing new in the world. It's all new buzzword and new concept. And my answer is DAO is indeed union. So if we view data, if we view data as an asset, as a digital asset, people who generate data, their labors. And you form a labor union today to achieve massive adoption, like millions of people in the union, that is the data DAO. So in a very large sense, DAO is union. And the first people who join the union, they are data laborers. And how to form that you know, data DAO or data union? 
you have to do something that, you know, in old time, if you have the Andrew Carnegie's factory treating employee badly, you have to fight back. How do you fight back? Today, the, the best way to fight back is, to, is by encryption, by encrypting data on platform like Facebook. We consume their server, consume their infrastructure, but without giving them any thing that they can utilize. So it's like destroying the machine, the factory, without even you know, losing uh, money. So what is data DAO? And what is the, the math book uh, I should put there uh, after data DAO? It's a mask on anything, including Facebook. And in order to achieve the data DAO, you have to mask yourself. You have to encrypt every data you send through a Facebook post. You keep using Facebook, Twitter, uh, WeChat, Telegram, anything. You don't leave them. You fight them back. You stay in the factory and destroy the machines of the, you know, capitalist and form the largest union in the history of the humanity. There will be millions of members joining the, the union, and that will be the largest DAO in the world. That is data DAO, or maybe call it data union. We won't lose anything, but we can gain the whole world. So that's the concept of data DAO. And my uh, own team is building the first thing that can work on the data DAO. It's called MassBook. You check out MassBook.com. It's a mask on Facebook. And it's a mask. There will be masks on anything. The more, the, the more de encryption data you post on this platform, the more they lose. You won't lose anything. And the more you can fight back. So that's our ideology of data DAO. Thanks. Um, you mentioned you'd already started working on part of it. Yeah. Um, how do you intend to do that? Is it on a Facebook app? Yeah, and, let's and, say, and um, just a, sorry, second part to that mm -hmm. is what's to stop them, be it an app or otherwise, from actually just blocking non-encrypted data? I'm on, um, okay, the first question, uh, it's very simple. If, you know, it's, um, the, op the web is open, so let's say Alice, you and me, Bob, uh, the traditional PGP or, or the end to encryption, they require a key server. And what we do is we have the peer-to-peer -peer KMNet system, and eventually there's no server, and the only server probably is the UI of Facebook. You, you still use the Facebook, but the key, the key management system is decentralized. So everything posted on Facebook is encrypted, uh, and not only the uh, recipient can receive it. And the encoding can, uh, cannot, cannot be gibberish, can also be emoji, can be pictures, uh, videos, anything, they can hide message. And for things like how can Facebook startups, if you, if you have Facebook or like uh, Instagram or uh, Messenger, you can try to type mathbook.com, try to send it to your friend. They already censor that. And you can't really um, send it out. But they can censor the link because it's centralized. They can censor uh, maybe a, a, you know, a word, but eventually if you have the encryption, you can change it into anything. They, can really they cannot really censor it. The, the only way they can censor is, is to ban massive amount of user, which is, I think it's, you know, it's um, against their personal, uh, against their personal interest, actually it's uh, against, uh, even against some, you know, law and constitution of many countries. That, that, I think that, that answers your question, yeah. Just try to type uh, masswood.com on Facebook, it, you, they will show the censorship, you know, to you. Yeah. That's it, thank you very much, Suji. Uh, the next talk is going to be Andreas Peterson with CO2 Pyramid. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. As you are all aware, we are facing an existential problem. The existential problem of the destruction of our planet. We are currently producing so much CO2 and we are doing really nothing against it. So we have tools in place that should force the politicians to do something about it. We have the Kyoto Protocol, we have the Paris Agreement, but there is a strong incentive system in place that forces everybody to wait as long as necessary to join these efforts, to wait as long as it's possible to do nothing, because that brings the greatest profit to the states. Shall we, do, shall we just let it happen? Shall we just let it slide? I think we should not go gently into that good night. We shall rage against this. And we will do something. As a crypto community, 
we have a very overly specific superpower. The overly specific superpower that we have is creating specialized Ponzi schemes that rewards early adopters, right? We will create a Ponzi scheme where the participants are not little consumers that are having their money stolen. We will create a Ponzi scheme that rewards early adopters of CO2 reduction and punishes those who are against this. So I think we should come together and we should form a DAO and apply all the dirtiest tricks in the book that we know of, make the greatest pyramid where people who are for CO2 reduction will be rewarded. And we have a great tool for that already now. We have free satellite systems in space that are right now creating real-time data where the CO2 is moving, where it is created, where is it moving. So we have all the data to create oracles on chain to automatically pay out to those who are behaving correctly and who are, couldn't be punished those who are not behaving correctly. So I think we should let the states play this out and we will create a framework for them to behave the way we think they should go. Thank you very much. So what I'm asking for is, we have some great ideas gathered. We want more ideas. We want to create this in a formal token system, a token economy to build uh, this system to bring those, those states on board. If they want or not, people will force them to join it because that's the profit path for the early adopters. Any questions? Very cool. Um, I do have a question. So it's relatively simple to incentivize uh, positive behavior. It's relatively harder, exponentially harder to punish uh, bad behavior, in, especially when there's nothing at sca stake. Oh, so no. thinking that all these corporations who are polluting the environment and producing all these carbon emissions, how would you go about punishing those people? Well, um, people joining the DAO will have to have an act uh, laws that uh, automatically have bilateral punishment in place. So if you have a graph of affiliate, an affiliate graph, right? We start with a few states as the founding members. They recruit more members. We have now affiliate uh, relationships that are bilateral contractual agreements. Those contractual agreements must include punishment methods. If I take you, if I'm a state and I recruit you as another state, uh, we have to put in an agreement that if one of us cheats you will have a punishment in a trade agreement, for example, in the form of tariffs, in the form of uh, taxes or sanctions against that state. And if you, are, if you say, okay, uh, this is the data, but I'm not adhering to the token model, I'm skipping out, then you have a bilateral, uh, uh, a, a bilateral contract that forces you to adhere to it and not some mystic uh, over state overarching entity. Yeah, any question? Yeah, I've got one more if you've got time. Um, so can you speak a little bit to the um, granularity of your Oracle solution compared to your membership criteria? Because it's like, if you're looking at individual membership and you're trying to pull some sort of um, information about CO2 emissions from three satellites, like how do those two things correlate? Well, the CO2 emissions, they are uh, data that are shown in the atmosphere and uh, using very simple methods, we can track the movement of the CO2 emissions. So that, and we have three independent measurement systems by the EU, by US and China. They have all independent uh, satellite systems in space. In Europe, it's the, uh, the Sentinel-5 uh, 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 system. And we can measure this on very uh, granular level. So these are the data that we can automatically extract to uh, bring this into, uh, to, to enact this on uh, using an Oracle and a DAO. And that is time. Thank you very much, Andreas. Next up, we have Alina Asiva with UniDAO. Alina. Hi, everyone. I'm Prisa. Hi all, my name is Alina, I'm from Moscow, Russia, and I'm presenting UniDAO. This is not a new investment protocol because we have so many excellent of them. It is a customization of Aragon stack to benefit the mutual fund infrastructure. So me and my friends, whom some of you know, Leo, Andre are building this customization, and I will tell you more about that. So essentially the fund will work as a system of two tokens, 
One is reputation, which is assigned to the people bringing up best investment proposals. And the second token is, invest is in investment money, which is transferable, traded on Uniswap, which allows easy trading on and off ramps. We are using the Aragon stack, uh, which consists of the vault custodian for the funds, the agent uh, app executing the result of voting to put the money in one of the lending protocols like Uniswap and Compound to execute trades on exchanges to lend out money for market makers, etc. So we created this two token system to protect the fund from 51% Sibyl attack. If someone enters the fund with $10 million funding, he or she doesn't necessarily gain the power of execution of investment strategies. And we have tested it recently by applying our system to the Sun shutdown. Uh, so the novelty of what we're building is sometimes questioned because protocols like Melonport already exist. But this is a completely different level of organization. So protocol is like basic level and it's not a competitor for us. But uh, one of the options where we could potentially invest in, it allows uh, the funds to invest only in trading and hot lead strategies and we are much broader. So for instance, we also will stake uh, in the live peer or uh, stake it in the Uniswap pools. So it's a lot of more DeFi functionality available. And we believe that we bring value to the Aragon community because we do really change the customization. So for instance, we built in the rage quit possibility, which is giving higher priority than voting for the app. So it allows the investors to exit the fund before in, in a time lock while the bad decision making is not yet being executed by proposed. So we also plan to transfer the voting into the side chain post like to not spend money of our investors for voting. And we also might add the anonymization layer with mixers between the wallet and agent. So you might ask now why I'm pitching that at a DICEO event because DICEO model is not the most optimal one for the investment fund manager. So we realized that instead of like only having two token system, we will need a third one to sponsor the uh, development of the system and that's where the ICO comes in place and we will arrange the allocated funds as a system of colonies in the beta app of our friends Colony and One Hive to enable the people working on this platform to work further in it. And it is like completely independent from the reputation of investors and from the value of asset funds locked. So to come it all together, I'm pitching here the new investment management customization for the Aragon stack. And if you can talk to me afterwards, we can integrate uh, the agent of Aragon with your DeFi system. If you want to invest in us, please talk to me. Or if you want to be friends with us, also talk to me. Thank you. You have a question? Uh, judges, you all have a mic over here? Yeah, I, I just haven't got the part on um, how you would integrate with um, other um, governance systems like uh, Colony. Have you mentioned Colony and what have? Could, could you just like yes. clarify that? Yes, absolutely. So uh, we would like to allocate the funds raised via the ICO into several type of colonies, let's say colony which posts, uh, colony is essentially like a, a um, task management uh, platform on Ethereum. So the tasks will be posted for different types of uh, developers, graphic designers, uh, marketing teams, and there will be budget assigned to each of them by the DAO and the executors of each task will receive the remuneration uh, for, for accomplishing this type of work. So this is, uh, this is what. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alina. Uh, next up, we've got Jason Chu with Empower. Jason.
Hello, everyone. Hello, dragons. My name is Jason. I'm from Malaysia. And I want to create a renewable energy fund powered by a DAO. So basically, how this fund would work is that people will buy the tokens and have a share of the fund. And we will use the money raised to give out microloans to people who want to install solar panels on their houses anywhere in the world. So why is that? Because, the, and how it will work, sorry, how it will work is that the fund performance would depend on how well we as fund managers in, within the DAO capitalize on all the government incentives throughout the world. Because here's the thing, even if the governments do give fantastic incentives, most people don't participate in installing panels because they don't want to come up with the upfront cost. And the banks are not giving loans for these kinds of projects because number one, it's a huge hassle for them to manage little, little, little projects like these houses. So the settlement part, okay, I think blockchain can solve. Number two, it is not in the bank's nature to give um, loans based on future returns, even though solar has been proven to be relatively stable and predictable. So why not let's become the white knight? So imagine, okay, that we create a DAO, okay, that can manage all these stakeholders, where if you wanted to install solar panels, okay, all you need to do is that now with this solution, instead of coming up with 100% upfront costs and saving 100%, you save 5%. And the remaining 95% is used to repay back the loan plus interest. So the people who own those, uh, who own the security tokens, they get a return as well. So by creating a win-win-win situation and by giving access to credit to people who cannot do this, I believe that that is one step further to promote and to efficiently uh, help governments throughout the world whenever they come up with incentives to increase the take-up rate. And we will achieve 100% renewable energy by the year 2068. Thank you. Questions. I'd like to welcome any questions from the dragons. No, I, I was wondering um, how how like a DAO is clearly uh, the right instrument to do that instead of some other vehicle. Very good question. So I was inspired. Okay, this idea came out out of DevCon itself. So I wanted, um, so the whole purpose of a DAO, in my opinion, is that whenever we wanted to start something new, even me, okay, is that you might want to start, you know, um, with good intentions. But when the money actually comes in, right, I, I believe that the DAO is the correct step to be free of corruption. That is what I believe. So if I were to start this, for example, I think that, when we are making millions and millions of dollars, it's going to be very difficult also for myself, okay, to carry that kind of weight of responsibility. Awesome. So you said that the performance of the, the fund will depend on how well um, the investments go all around the world. So having a global approach to this it seems like what you're going to end up with is with a lot of um, projects where there are incentives, but not so many in places that maybe there are not so many governmental incentives for homely owned um, solar panels in their homes, but they happen to be some of the most polluting countries everywhere. So at the beginning, do you think the impact is actually going to be quite minimal because you're going to be, if, if that's the only thing, huh? um, you, you're actually going to be targeting the places that needed the, le the, the least. Thank you very much for that question. The answer is yes. But I believe that the impact will still be phenomenal because what this would actually do is to encourage homeowners. We are serving the underserved right now. You encourage homeowners to go out there and say that, hey, there is an incentive to install solar panels. I don't need to come up. I just say 5% energy bill. 
okay, and there's more so solar electricity in the world. With increased demand for solar electricity, okay, prices of solar panels can finally come down. And then innovations. I want people to actually, you know, buy solar panels like they buy smartphones. That's the future, and that's the change that I want to create. So thank you very much for that question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, we're in the home stretch, folks. We got four, four more pitches left. Uh, so next up, we've got Will and Griff with CIC Dow. Hey, everybody. I'm Will. I'm Griff. And it's Sick Dow, because it's sick. Thank you. Yeah. So, I came to Kenya 12 years ago after believing this idea that you could just give people the ability to make their own currency and that that would actually give them the ability to tap into their own potential. That they don't need external money pumped into them, they just need the ability to believe in what they have and trade with each other. And so I started printing pieces of paper about 10 years ago. This landed me in jail for quite some time. and. Uh, it worked really, really well. Eventually, they let us go, and they said, you can keep doing this, because there's no law being broken, but it's totally unregulated. So it's, a, it's an exciting time. We just moved on to blockchain. We've got 6,000 users right now. These are women selling vegetables. There's schools. There are uh, haircuts, everything you can have in the community. And they're trading with each other every single day. We've had 70,000 transactions in the last five months. And all of that's on the blockchain. You can go to our GitHub, you can see all these transactions. And recently we've started working with Oxfam and Red Cross, and they're super excited about this as an alternative to just dumping money on communities. What, what can they do? They can seed these. And so we've been using bonding curves. We forked the Bancor protocol onto XDAI. And basically what we do is we say, well, a community can socially back these, they can create a currency, they, they we're using their phones now, so these are feature phones. We've got a, a server sitting on the telecoms there in Kenya, and so we're using button phones with no internet. It pushes directly into uh, XDAI. The block, the, everything's recorded on the blockchain. We send receipts as SMSs to all the users, and people are using it every day. Right now, we've got about 200 transactions, two to 400 transactions a day among about 6,000 users, and it's, it's growing right now mostly by word of mouth. And they also ability, have the ability to take their money and stake it into a savings account, right? So we're working mostly with women's groups that are saving about a dollar a week. And so they have about $200. They put that into a savings fund that they hold and they own, and they can leverage that using a bonding curve into a local credit. So really what we're trying to do is monetary expansion. There's not enough money out there. Even if Red Cross dumps all their money on those communities, it doesn't really matter. All of it's going to end up in Nairobi anyways, and there's not enough money, period. So if there's a way they can create their own money, wonderful. If they can back it, not just socially, but with actual on-chain collateral, then basically we're creating really, really small community banks, right? We're allowing them to use bonding curves to create their own local credit. They accept those credits for savings. They use them for school fees, so there's a demand on these. As the value goes up on that curve, there's, a, there's the ability for them to cash those out, right, using M-Pesa, using the, the, the local e-money systems. This is not just Kenya. We're looking at Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Cameroon, Vanuatu, Philippines, and um, Red Cross is super excited about this, Oxfam. I mean, there's, there's a huge amount of excitement, so we've got some traction. It's very exciting. What we're missing is a governance structure. We have no real ability for Red Cross or Oxfam to basically choose and decide how could they seed those funds? How could they go out and seed those community groups? How do they process all that data from those groups? How do they use this as an alternative to cash transfer? And so that's why we've been looking at the common stack. We've been looking at all these things and saying, well, can we use the same mechanism? Can we use this idea of a bonding curve to give governance structures to this and also give sponsorship ability, right? So if Oxfam wants to come in and say, look, we want the parameters to work like this. We want to we want to give to uh, uh, places affected by vol volcanoes or food security or droughts, and we want to have our name attached to it. Well, that's a, a perfect use case for having some kind of voting token. Right? And so we can use the same concept of bonding curves in that way. So we bring in the money, 
we put it into a fund. And actually, I, I'm going to let Griff talk a little bit more about it. Okay. Yeah. So uh, we would use a bonding curve at the front. The goal of the DAO above all of the token bonding curves that are already being used, the goal would be to actually create a funding mechanism and a, basically an, a micro economy around starting these community currencies in Kenya and all over the world. So uh, w instead of the Red Cross and Oxfam donating and just losing their money, they would actually participate in, they would buy into the bonding curve and receive a voting token that would allow them to cooperate and make, uh, coordinate decision making on where the best place to start these currencies would be. And then there would be a tap that would constantly be funding into a DAO that would make, a, that they would use that f those funds to actually uh, seed the community building that is required to start these local currencies in different uh, impoverished areas in the world. Uh, I think that's it. That's awesome. Uh, I'm curious, like you're saying that's, um, can, uh, like you're actually doing that in Kenya, um, probably Mozambique or uh, something like that. Uh, what 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 kind of community is it using the thing? Like, is it uh, cities, um, you know, small communities? How does it work? So we're about fifty fifty in urban slums and rural villages, and I mean the systems work really. I mean, when people are issuing their credit, they use them in a lot of unique, different ways. And sometimes it's it's for church tithings. They do it for savings and loan. They do it for, I, there's a, quite a few Muslim communities using it in sadaqahs, as in uh, zakat at the end of the year for Ramadan. So there's a lot of really diverse use cases. I don't even, I mean, it, it's it's really uh, eye-opening. It's They teach us, basically. They need money for all sorts of things. And it's just basically saying, like, look, you guys, create your own use your own belief system, use your own rules. We follow a lot of the, so small savings and loan groups are one, PTAs, like parent-teacher associations for schools, um, schools using it for salary advances. So basically, there's a huge credit gap, right? So there's $2.6 trillion, according to World Bank, missing from the world in terms of credit. There's another $2.6 trillion missing from sustainable development goals. And, and we're basically saying they can create it themselves, right? We don't need it from banks. We don't need it. We, we just need to allow communities to basically tap into the potential of using their own bonding curves backed by their own goods and services and social capital and, and actual collateral. And so that's where we're bringing in DAI as the external collateral, basically to say, it, you know, if he's part of the network and he drops out of the network, well, what's, what's this a guarantee against? What's it, you know, so having DAI there is, is basically giving us a way of, of bringing in the rest of the financial industry as well as all the aid organizations. And I think it's worth mentioning that we're that they're actually using feature phones and USSD codes to send money on uh, POA network and XDI. Oh, it was originally on POA network. Now it's on XDI. So people are using feature phones to be sending crypto around. It's pretty incredible. One last one. Later. Thank you very much. Big round of applause. Oh, sorry, you're good. Uh, Three more left. Next up, we have Ivan with Clarity Dow. I want to apologize in advance for the pedestrian name. Like it, it was, I, I thought about it for a total of one minute, so it's not really original. But um, what I wanted to address is sort of a like very particular problem. Uh, I before I went to blockchain, I worked as a machine learning engineer in Yandex, which is a Russian search engine, and. When you're a machine learning engineer, uh, when you have to tackle a sort of a new problem that nobody else thought about, and so there are no data sets, uh, your best strategy of like, creating a new data set is label and labeling it as to shoot yourself, I guess. Because uh, like what you can do is you can do it yourself, uh, but it's extremely arduous work. Like you have a thousand, two thousand samples that each of them has to be looked through and labeled. And you can also use uh, Amazon Mechanical Turk, I guess, but the thing about that is that it basically employs people from third world countries that work for a dollar an hour. And you can imagine that the quality of the final data set will not be as high. And of course, it's exploitative as well. So what I wanted to propose here is a sort of a crypto economic mechanism uh, to allow groups of experts to label data sets. So 
what we want to do here is that we have a sort of a limited group of experts, maybe, I don't know, five, eight, ten of them. And we want to allow them to vote for uh, particular samples of the data set, whether to include them in the final data set or not, or uh, just to check their quality. And here we have a problem, which is inherent to Shell and Coin, for example, is that they can just collude and produce the same answer. But it, it's, uh, it's not useful to us because, uh, well, it doesn't really carry any useful information. So what we have here is these uh, experts, they stake some coins, and then they vote for each individual object in the data set, yes or no. And they have this Boolean vector which they commit to by simply hashing it and putting a hash onto the chain. So what happens next is that they reveal all of their answers and based on the fraction of the yes answers for each object, object gets included into the final data set or not. So that ensures quality. But the, the important thing is, is that if you actually vote counter to the consensus, so to say, uh, you get penalized for each individual object. So where does this factor into this problem with shell and coin? Then we introduce this mechanism. If you want, if these experts want, want to coordinate, they have to provide each other with, the, with their entire sort of commitment, their, their entire vector, because otherwise they will just say, okay, you're going to screw me because you will get my money when you learn my answers and you will vote counter to me. So, but if they, if they receive this entire vector, they can just submit it to the blockchain and prove that data leaked from somewhere and they can just steal their entire stake. So th that's how it works in terms of the incentives and the economic design. Uh, and for, from the standpoint of governance and just the DAO itself, like for people just create new tokens to uh, bet on the data sets that they want to see in the system. And th this money goes to the organization that manages this sort of infrastructure, this data set ar archive. Like uh, they manage infrastructure, these, the storage infrastructure, they manage, uh, they hire talent, they source new experts, uh, they improve outreach. So. As the demand for the data sets grows, so, so does the price in the smart contract in the bonding curve. So that leaves the organization with more money just to increase their storage capacities and hire new talent and generally just to allow these additional data sets to be uh, stored and uh, evaluated. And I guess that's it. So, questions? I don't, I, um, how exactly would you like um, store these data sets in question? Well, I, I mean, they're stored basically centrally, like in the in the simplest case, by an organization that just sort of manages this DAO. So you have people that vote with their tokens for the uh, for the how for what, what people actually manage it, like for for what people belong to this organization. But in the end, this organization uh, just does all the day-to-day -day stuff because you can't have the token holders vote like for, for each small decision, right? Have you looked into Aragon Courts? Into what? Aragon Courts. Aragon Coins. Courts. No, not really. Because court system like a, a jurisdiction. Yes, it's essentially made for decentralized arbitration. Mm -hmm. But for example, Kleros ran an experiment where they uh, tried to test the um, sort of resilience of their system by um, incentivizing Byzantine behavior where uh, they wanted the pictures of Doge, you know, Dogecoin. And uh, if you could actually trick the system, uh, trick the voters, the jurors, uh, and put a cat picture in there and they wouldn't recognize it, then you would sort of, or they would uh, collude with you on that, then uh, sort of you would get the money, sort of say. So they're incentivizing uh, to test the resilience of the system in a way. So this is kind of like same as labeling data sets, right? Uh, in, a, in a certain way. Obviously it's a visual vector, but uh, do you think Aragon Court can be utilized for such a uh, mechanism? But in this case that you mentioned where, for example, people just, well, this is, this is an experiment, right? So people are incentivized to behave Byzantinely, but if they try to collaborate, like th they know that this is, the, thanks, that this is a picture of a cat. So if, uh, 
if they try to say that it's a dog, then uh, just someone else may say, okay, I know that this guy is going to try to trick us, so let's all vote that this is a, a, actually a cat and steal their stake. Or moreover, if you know that for, for the rest of the answers they're going to answer truthfully, you can just submit like their, their entire answer, their Boolean vector onto the blockchain and steal their entire stake. Yeah, that's the point of the experiment, but I was wondering if you could use this system shelling point game for uh, what you're proposing. All right, and that's time. Thank you very much. We got two more left. Uh, we have Bradley Clark with Creators Guild. Bradley. Hello, everyone. Uh, so, this competition is about uh, dream DAOs. I'm going to share a dream of mine that I've actually been developing since 2005, uh, Creators Guild. So, um, the problem's a little complex, just bear with me for a second, but I'm going to talk about um, royalties, right? So, um, in the Hollywood studio system, royalties were negotiated by the artists in favor of the artists, and for a long time, it was a good life for the people who were artists. They were able to get a fair share of the earnings from the works that they produced. Um, as scarcity, as, as the ability to transmit their artworks got simpler, scarcity, the natural built-in defensible scarcity, decreased. And eventually, if any of you are like me, you probably got your start on this path by eliminating that scarcity by, right, distributing some things maybe. But also as an artist, I want to be able to distribute and make sure that I retain value. It's also, we live in remix culture, right? We're constantly just reusing everybody's work. And that's fantastic, it's beautiful. That's how ideas evolve. Um, so, Creators Guild is a guild we want to create marketplaces for creators to be able to list their content, post each individual piece of content on a bonding curve, contribute funds back from the reuse of that content to the artist, make sure they always have continued exposure to the secondary market, tertiary markets. Anytime that gets repeated, they get credit and uh, earnings, we want to get big enough that we can actually partner, like, build extensions around the distribution platforms that exist right now and control the flow of content on those platforms, create our own platforms, right? We are all creators here. We should be able to retain the value and share that value with everybody else. That's a very high level explanation. Thank you for listening. So a lot of times, any any time you're trying to is it too quiet? How, how do you handle um, piracy? Yeah, um, we probably need to. Uh, First of all, you can take care of some degree of piracy uh, just using the technology that we, that we know how to use, right? So that's the first layer. Second layer is that we would likely need to uh, build some protocols to, um, you can't prevent everything, but you can, if the system that we build is smooth enough and easy enough, people will prefer to use it over piracy anyway, right? Like, I never really wanted to pirate music. That just was the only way to get it in my farm town where I grew up, right? So, if you're using bonding curves for the, um, yeah, if you're using bonding curves for the remix process, yeah, uh, how are you setting price for the consumption of these oh, goods? Oh, yeah. So, so one thing that's really important is that artists should be able to set the value for their content as they feel it deserves to be valued, right? And so, basically, you can create 
a situation where each piece of content is always on a continuous auction, and then you can even um, specify what ratio, like once it's on the bonding curve, you can specify how the money gets split so that it can go back to repaying the DAO, it can go back to funding common good, it can stay with the artist. And all of these things can be known. And so when you're making choices about which content to remix, that might even play into the next artist's choice, where that money is going to wind up. Thank you very much, Bradley. Next up, our last pitch of the evening is going to be Sergey Kuntz with Lend Dow. Welcome, Sergey. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for this long waiting for the last pitch. I hope you are not tired. Um, so. Um, my name is Sergey, I'm from Germany, and I'm Cryptomaniac. Um, I'm going to talk about the LandDAO. Uh, LandDAO is an extension of Aragon, which um, the first step would improve uh, the uh, usability to invest uh, in, uh, in uh, DAO ICOs, uh, with uh, example, uh, any RC20 token or Ether which would be converted automatically out of box um, uh, to, uh, example, DAI stable token, uh, which would be land on uh, compound to uh, earn the interest rates. And um, also the project teams in the DAO ICO need, need to be paid with a token. Yeah? And you can pay the um, teams with every token you want on ERC20. So, um, this is the project, and if you have any questions, you're welcome. Okay, um, I think uh, I will try to, to implement that on the next uh, ETH uh, hackathon in Waterloo. See you there. Yeah, sorry. Um, so, at we. Can you describe the flow of the money, um, how you're raising funds, and how these funds are issued through the DAO? Uh, the fundraising would be uh, happening through uh, like normal ICO uh, from all the people uh, who wants to invest in the, in the project, and uh, it would be uh, easier than a normal way to, I don't know, you, you maybe not have the DAI token, and you, you have only the Ether, and you have only WBTC, but you want uh, to invest in, in such project, so you can just uh, apply or invest with every token you, you have. So, uh, um, what, what was the second question? <laughs> that, that was, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the distributing to the team, so I already explained, so the same way, like incomes or outgoing things, like uh, exchanging on a Uniswap, Kyber, Bank, or whatever, or aggregating things. Yeah, that's, that's it. Thank you so much. All right, that, that is all of the pitches for this evening. And so now the judges shall deliberate, add up their scores, and we will pick the first place and runner up winners of the second Dream Dow Pitch Contest, Daiko Edition. All right. <laughs> The moment you all have been waiting for. The winners of the second Dream Dow Pitch Contest. We've got to put Pickle Rick down for this one. First place, Will and Griff with Sick Dow. <laughs> Woo, congratulations, Will and Griff. Yeah, come up. Come up here. Come up here, guys. Come up here. Congratulations. Thank you for participating. All right. Second place in the pitch contest is Paul Lansky with InfraDAO. Where are you at, Paul? Where are you at? 
There we go. There we go. Down the line. All right. So, first place winners get 500 die and 500 A and T. Paul, you get 250 die and 250 A and T. We hope we we hope you use it to seed your your uh, give some seed funding to your dream Dicos and make it happen. We'll be, we'll follow up uh, to to get your contact information, get the address, and also. We, we want to see what you do with your Dicos. Thank you all for participating. Thank you all for coming. Enjoy the rest of the party. We're going to have DJs. We've still got food, sushi, drinks until 9.30. Get all the drinks you can. you got 22 minutes to drink up. Thank you all.